Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. I have a MacBook Air here that has a firmware password on it and uh, I do not know this firmware password. The customer does not know this firmware password. They have legitimately purchased the laptop secondhand. Previous owner had a firmware password on it, which means we're unable to reinstall MacOS. Um, so yeah, this basically sucks. There's no bypass for this password without hardware um, repairs, which we're going to demonstrate in this video. So yeah, there is no resets. There's no, I forgot my password. This is the hardware motherboard password. So firstly, word of caution, do not set this password unless you genuinely have mission critical security information. Use something like uh, File Vault instead, which is software encryption, uh, because that can be, you can reset or recover data that has been encrypted with something like File Vault if you are able to recover the Apple account and things like that. Basically, there are channels you can go through to recover that scenario. However, this password cannot be recovered. The only thing we can do is reprogram the chip that contains this password. So yeah, a lot of people set this thing as a privacy filter. Now, this does prevent uh, a lot of common ways of accessing a Mac to which you do not know the password. However, the problem is, is if you forget it, then there is no reset. So with that warning out of the way, let's proceed. So we don't know this password. Let's turn this off. What we have to do is we have to replace the EFI chip, the EFI BIOS chip on this uh, laptop. So I'm going to take the back cover off. So the chip that we need to replace is on the bottom side of the motherboard. So the next thing I'm going to do is take out this logic, uh, this motherboard known as the logic board. I'll probably use motherboard and logic board interchangeably. Whatever. Let's get to it. So I'm going to disconnect this battery over here and start taking bits out. Now, uh, I have explained in fairly great detail how to remove the logic board from a MacBook Air in a video where I did a keyboard replacement on a MacBook Air before. So I'll link that video in in the cards right up in the top right corner of your screen now. And if you want to more information on how to disassemble these, check that video. I'm going to fast forward through this bit. All right, now the guy that we need to repair is this chap here. So let's just zoom in on that to get a closer look. So this is the BIOS chip or the EFI chip for the laptop. And I've got some replacements for this guy. So um, it is absolutely possible to remove this chip, reprogram it in a programmer, and then put it back on the board again. However, I cheated and I just bought a couple of replacement pre-programmed chips um, online to use instead. So I got mine from eBay and I'm going to put one of mine on the board. However, afterwards I'll remove this one and I'll see if my um, if my EEPROM programmer can actually read and write this chip. Hopefully I might be able to demonstrate how to reprogram it. However, in the worst case scenario, I bought these for a couple of quid each on eBay. So it's no big deal just to buy some nice shiny new pre-done ones. The reason why I bought two of them was in case I messed one of them up. Right, I'm just going to put some protective mats down on my desk. Right, now I'm going to switch on my hot air station, which I'm going to set to 450 degrees C at maximum airflow. And we need to remove this chip from the board. So I'm going to add in some flux just to help spread the heat around this guy. These larger chips are, can be a little bit tricky to remove on a cold board. This guy shouldn't put up too much of a fight, but... Uh, I'm running out of flux in this syringe. I'll put some flux there anyway, just because it helps move the heat around. And I'll start off from a distance with my hot air station and just blow some heat into the board. And once the board has warmed up a bit, I'll go in close and then we'll really get that chip out.
That'll probably do it. Here we go. Now I'll get one of the new chips out. Now I could probably just flow the new chip on straight away. However, I'm going to touch up the pads with some fresh solder um, just to get some leaded solder onto there. Um, as I said, we'd probably find just be fine just flowing the new chip on immediately, but I'll touch the pads up anyway just because that makes sure that I'll get a nice, decent, solid connection. All right, now we come in with the hot air again. And I'm going to turn my airflow down to about 75% this time. Just be a little bit more gentle. Get some heat down there. And get this chip on there. And you see that little bit of elasticity there? That means that's flowing. And I'll let it cool. Now I'm just going to hold that down with the tweezers and flow it again. There we go. And we just had some solder balls jump out the side there. So that just tells me that all of the excess solder is out. In fact, that was quite a lot of solder balls. I'm not, sh not convinced about that. I think I'm just going to remove those solder balls and then flow that one more time. I wasn't expecting that much. I probably had a little bit too much on the pad still. Now I'm going to squirt some isopropyl alcohol onto the area. That is going to cool the board down and it's also just going to let me just brush away some of this flux. There we go. That guy should be ready to go back in the laptop now. That's everything inside. Let's reconnect the battery and check if we are WinRAR. After I've uh, after I've taken a MacBook Air apart, I tend to turn it on with the cover off first because then I can see what the fan is doing, uh, which helps me understand whether it's turning on and starting and that kind of thing. So I'll press the power button on the keyboard and the fan has started spinning. All right, there we go. We've got a chime. Uh, holding down option. I'm not sure if I was quick enough for the boot menu yet, but we'll find out in a sec. Okay, we've got a flashing question mark folder. I'm going to turn it off and start it again. And this time I'm holding down the option before the chime. So we should get the boot menu. Here we go, now we've got a boot menu. Right, so we've got a boot menu, which means our firmware password is gone, but it's not detecting the SSD. Uh, however, there may be no data on this because the customer had just purchased the laptop. So it's entirely possible that the SSD is just empty. Um, so yeah, in fact, I'm, I believe the SSD is literally empty. 
So, fine. Well, we can quickly solve this by plugging in a uh, MacOS flash drive. You could also go to internet recovery. However, I don't got time for that. I shall put the bottom cover on this just so I can put it up right properly. The fact that I've gotten this far means that we've already won. However, it would obviously just be nice for you guys to see that we can actually get this into a usable state now. There's my Mojave flash drive, so I'll start booting from that. And we'll just get as far as um, disk partition, um, uh, disk utility, just so we can see that that SSD is actually fitted and recognized. Because obviously, if the SSD is not connected, then we have another problem with this laptop. I don't think this section is actually relevant to the video, but we'll just make sure. There we go, and that SSD is definitely detected. And there's no data on it at all, which is why we couldn't boot. So yeah, interestingly, it's been formatted, just not installed. There we go. So that proves that we're all finished here. So what I'll do now is I'll go ahead and erase this again, and I will install MacOS on it. And this laptop will be ready to use. Cool, so mission success. So what I want to do now is moving forward, I'd like to be able to reprogram these chips myself without having to buy replacement chips off of eBay. So I have a known good replacement chip because I've just used the other one of these and it worked just fine. So I know that I've got a correct working chip here with this spare and this guy I know has got a password on it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get out my programmer and um, we need to get these hooks up into my programmer and I want to do a dump of both of the BIOSes from these chips. We'll quickly compare them and we'll see that they're different and what we'll do is we'll copy the BIOS from this one, program it on this one and now I'll have two spare chips. And I'll also have a copy of the BIOS so I can reprogram chips in the future as well. Now, in order to get this tiny little EEPROM into my um, uh, USB programmer I've got here, I need what's called a WSON adapter. Um, now, most of the uh, EEPROMs that I've previously worked with have looked a little bit like, like this, where, as you can see, it's actually got leggies that stick out of it. And those fit into the uh, SOP adapters, the surface mount adapters I've got. But I don't have anything for this W uh, SOP adapter. Um, I do have these little breakout boards that are also for SOP. Um, and these are designed just for prototyping and stuff like that. However, I reckon that I can actually fit this on here. I'll show you that up close so you can see. I have ordered the correct adapter. However, I've got to get it from China and I don't really want to wait three weeks to finish this video off. As you can see, I can actually fit that guy on there nicely and it just about goes on. And if I just turn it over, I just need to make sure that we don't short that ground pad on the bottom against these pins. And, oh, it's going to be tight. It's going to be real tight. But I think if we get that positioned perfectly, I think we'll be all right. This might be more luck than skill though when it comes down to it. So we'll tin up the pads on this and we'll just see if we can flow that into place. Then once it's on, we'll do use the continuity test on our multimeter to check if that's okay or not. So as I say, this is not what I would say is the recommended method of doing it. However, this is how I'm gonna do it. Let's check if we shorted to hell and back. No, that should go to pin one. Yeah, what about the other side? How about that? I genuinely didn't think that was going to work. Right, now I've just got to do a little bit more work. I've just got to stick some uh, leggies on the bottom of this guy. So I'll put it in a vise for that.
I'll stick it straight into my programmer. So this is a 3 volt chip, which I have determined by looking up the uh, data sheet for the chip. So I can put that straight in there without needing an adapter. And I've dialed it in as um, the actual chip is an MX25L6470. Uh, um, however, my software doesn't have that exact chip, but it has detected one that is near enough, which is the 6465E. Now if I hit test, then we get a communication successful there, chip type SPI flash. So uh, this is close enough. The variation between them is not going to be enough to actually be any kind of issue. So let's do a read off of that and see what we get out of it. So we've pulled some data out of this chip and that is going to be our password protected EFI. So this is the stuff that we want to overwrite. So now I know that this setup works, I'm going to go ahead and put the good chip that I've got onto the same board and then we can pull the BIOS off of this one, program it onto there, and we'll have two unlocked chips again, which I can then reuse in other repairs. Yep. Both times no shorts. I thought it was going to be a lot harder to get this guy centered so that that center pad wasn't shorting everything out. But yeah, apparently, apparently that's easier than it looked. Okay, and now we're running a Winbond chip. So um, the software has also detected that for me, which is nice. So let's go for another read. And in case you're wondering if it's okay to be swapping out different models and makes of chip here, it's perfectly fine. This is what um, the SPI standard is all about. All of these chips all work in more or less exactly the same way, by and large, as long as they're the same standard of chip. So you can swap out different, um, you can swap out different brands of chip as long as it's the same type with the same capacity and properties and so on, which both of these chips have. They're both interchangeable. So we can lift all of the data off of one, off of this Winbond chip, put it onto the MXIC chip, and that's completely fine. There we go, that's that done. So now we'll pop that out. Suddenly occurred, I've suddenly realized I should have put the two chips on two different boards, because now I've got to swap the heckin' things over again. I, my methodology for this is horrendously inefficient. But hey, this is discovery for you. I don't always know exactly what I'm doing in these videos. Sometimes you guys are just along for the ride while I figure it out. And in case you're wondering why I didn't start by putting the known good chip on there first to get the BIOS off of it, uh, the reason for that was I wasn't sure whether I was going to blow the chip up doing this or not. So I wanted to start off with the rubbish chip that was potentially going to get chucked in the bin anyway. And I wanted to make sure that when I soldered it onto this board and put it in my programmer, we didn't melt it or anything like that. So that's why I started on it. So not the most efficient way around, but the safest way so I could practice on a currently bad chip. However, now what we're going to do, we're putting the password protected chip back in and we're going to unpassword protect it. All right, so I've reselected the MXIC chip. And I'll just open, there we go. So I've just opened the dump that I saved from the other chip. So we've got our known good one here. Now, if I verify this against what's in this chip, we should find, there we go, we get an, a flash check error. So the contents of these chips are not the same, which is exactly what we expected. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll reprogram it. So I'm gonna hit auto, and it's gonna erase the flash memory, program it with what we've got here, and then verify that. And then we should come back with a successful verify, which means the contents of both of these chips will be the same, and that contents will be the unpassword protected EFI. And then I'll have two good chips again. Yeah. And our programming is now complete. So we've now flashed the original chip with a non-password protected EFI ROM. Uh, and so now we could put this back into a laptop. I'm not going to put it back into the laptop that I had at the start of the video because that thing now works and I'm shipping it out. Um, however, the next time one comes in, I could use either the other brand new Winbond chip I bought 
or I could reuse this one in that laptop and it'd be absolutely fine. And that would allow me to very quickly turn that laptop around by swapping the chip out with another known good one that I've pre-programmed. Or failing that, now I have a copy of the ROM for that particular logic board, um, I can just remove that chip, put it on this board, program it, then put it back in the laptop again, which I think is what most people generally do. And in terms of supply of the chips, uh, now I know that I've got a tried and tested method, uh, I could go ahead and buy these chips in bulk from somewhere like AliExpress and buy them on the cheap, uh, probably for pennies each instead of paying a few pounds per chip. So in this instance, because I was doing this as a one-off, I didn't mind paying a few, a few quid for each chip. I think I paid about £10 for two of them or something like that, um, which is quite a lot. But as a one-off, I don't mind. Um, and now I have the setup and I've done all of this and I have the expertise, the next ones I do, I can do for very cheap because I've done the method, I know how it works and I'll be able to get it done very quickly. And in addition to that, if I happen to get exactly the same logic board, I've got two chips that are already programmed and ready to go. So thank you very much for watching everyone. I hope you guys found that interesting and I will see you all in the next video. Uh, stick around for the end card to see my support links for my, um, uh, my Twitter, my Discord and my Patreon. Those are also down in the description below. Thanks a lot guys. Bye for now.